we're coming to the last of the ser- seri- uh, messages in this series called Sacred Stories from the Bible. And for some reason, <laughs> the Lord laid upon my heart to bring this message on, on uh, Satan. And to be frank with you, it, it's one of the messages I'd rather, rather not speak on, really. <laughs> I have dealt with this through this week, wondering, oh my goodness, how am I going to get through this one? And so I'm going to ask you, if you would, just to force yourself to pay attention. I know that a lot of times our minds begin to wonder, Satan will do that. Satan doesn't want you to hear what I'm going to say today. And you need to hear this. We all need to hear this. And one of the ways that... um, I felt like maybe we can all pay very close attention would be to put a outline on the back of the bulletin, which is quite large. And if you're not a note taker, that's all right. If you are a note taker, you better write fast because we got a lot of information to cover this morning and there's a lot of empty blanks there for you to fill. And with the Lord's help, you'll be able to fill them. And um, I know that Satan works overtime trying to get our attention away from what God has for us. And so, uh, if you use your phone for the Bible, I, I would ask you, we have the Bible on the wall this, this morning, but just take your phone, turn it off, and put it away somewhere so... It's not going to be a distraction to you or to anybody else that's sitting around you. And just, if you can, just just pay careful attention. This is a hard subject. And this is a difficult one. And Satan does not want us to talk about this. But uh, this is what God has placed upon my heart. And I hope that as we go through all of this and when we come to the end, that it'll be a help to you. And that as we leave and as we live the rest of our lives here on earth, that we'll be able to handle and deal with our enemy who is Satan in a far better way because of what we have learned this morning. Our text comes from the book of 1 Peter chapter 5, and we'll read just two verses, 8 and 9. Here's what it says. Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are now accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. There's a lot to say within those two verses because we have an enemy, and we have an enemy that is brutal. He's attacking, he's destructive, he's unrelenting, and he is described for us within those two verses. And in the next few moments, we're going to try to unpack those verses and find out what the Lord is trying to tell us about this evil person called Satan. Imagine, if you would, going into a zoo and walking around with your family and you're just enjoying the beauty of the day You're looking at the various kinds of animals that are found there. And all of a sudden, they're on the PA system. Somebody comes over that PA system and says, I need your attention, folks. We want to inform you that the lion has escaped his enclosure. And he is now roaming around the zoo. By the way, he has not eaten yet today. Pay careful attention where you go and make sure your kids are right in your sight. (laughs) Just imagine how you would tread very carefully around that zoo. And that's what our enemy is doing to us. He is like a roaring lion wandering around seeking whom he may devour. He is invisible, he is deadly. He is more deadlier than any other lion that would be on the face of the earth. And this is the one 
that we're facing day after day after day. There's four things that are found within those two verses that tell us a little bit about this enemy of ours. Number one, let's talk about his identity. His identity. And this is found in verse number eight. There are four words I want you to notice. Your adversary, the devil. Your adversary, the devil. The word adversary, of course, means enemy. And the word devil actually means slanderer. He is one who will attack another by, slen uh, by slander. He first appears in Genesis chapter number 3. Then we do not read about him anymore after Revelation chapter 20. From Genesis 3 to Revelation 20, that's where Satan is roaming here on earth. In other words, for the existence of man here on earth, there has always been this Satan. From Genesis 3 to Revelation 20, he has always been in human history. And I realize that there are those who do not necessarily believe in a literal devil. And maybe that's because we live in a day and age where a lot of people say that, well, the devil just doesn't really exist. There is no real devil. People who are unbelievers don't give a whole lot of thought to whether or not there's a Satan. And would you believe that there is a lot of Christians who don't give a whole lot of thought to whether or not there is a Satan or there is a devil? Most people will think that he is some of this cartoon character who wears a funny little red suit Maybe has a goatee over here. Not that a goatee is wrong. Because I know some of you guys have them. <laughs> he maybe has a couple of horns that grow out of his head. Maybe a tail that comes out behind him. And he just hops around going from one place to another. And that's more or less the consensus that we have about Satan. But in all reality... Satan is more than that. He is more than just a metaphor for evil. Now, just in case I am talking to somebody who believes that there is no devil, let me ask you and propose to you this question. How much stock do you put in the words of the Lord Jesus Christ concerning the devil? What is your source of authority. And quite honestly, that is the real issue here. Where do we look to to get authority for what we believe and for what we think? A lot of people will get their authority from the culture. And whatever the culture says and whatever it does, well, that's what we'll go along with and that's what we'll believe and from that culture is where we get our authority. Some get their authority from their past tradition. Now, this is what Granny always believed. This is what Grandpa always said. And this has been passed down. And we get our authority from tradition. Others might get their authority from their friends, whatever their friends say. Hey, that's good enough for me. And then there are others who will get their authority Kind of like, well, how do I feel at the moment? But those of us who know Christ is our Savior, where we get our authority indeed is from this book right here. We don't have to go any farther, but this is where we get our authority. This is the authority of our life. Therefore, we will put our stock, we will put everything that we believe in that book, in the Word of God. That's our authority. And so if you don't believe in a literal devil, then what you're saying is your authority is not the Bible. Because the Bible talks about a literal Satan. Now, Peter in our text, he portrays and pictures him as a roaring lion. One who is roaming around seeking who may, may, may devour. 
But I just got to tell you that he is also one who is a great disguiser. We know him, the Bible says he is a lion. But he never is portrayed like that to us. In fact, Jesus said one time that he is like a sheep in wolf's clothing. If you want to know the big characteristic about Satan, it's all about deception. It's all about cover up. It's all about our enemy coming to us as a friend. When in all reality, he is our enemy. When Satan first appeared to Eve back there in Genesis, he questioned God. He basically was saying, you mean to tell me that God actually said that you shouldn't eat of that tree? You mean to tell me that God really doesn't want you to enjoy eating of that tree? Are you saying, Eve, that God is saying, don't take of this tree? Now, if you'll come in my direction, Eve and Adam, I'll give you anything you want. He's a deceiver. He's a liar. He comes off so deceptive and so friendly, never like a lion. Did you know that everybody has a relationship with Satan? Everybody. He either is our friend or he is our enemy. For those of us who are born again believers and on our way to heaven, he indeed is our enemy. Our enemy, our text says, he is our adversary, the devil. He is a literal, invisible devil. And he's roaming around seeking whom he may devour. So let's hasten on to the second point here, and that is his strategy. His strategy. Now, once again, if you will, look at the uh, eighth verse of First Peter chapter 5, and just these words, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. The word devour is a very strong word. It actually means to gulp down. In other words, Satan is looking for somebody to eat. So, how does he devour people? All right, number one, the major aim of Satan to devour people is to get as many people as he can on the face of the earth to burn in hell with him forever. He does not want anybody to go to heaven. He wants everyone to go to hell. Hell was never made for people. Hell was made for the devil and his angels. But misery always loves company. And so Satan is trying to get as many people as he can to reject Christ, die without Christ, and spend their eternity in hell. Now, here's number two. If a person gets saved, he cannot now drag them down into hell with him. Somebody who has come to Christ, here's how he devours that person. And most of us here this morning know Christ. We're not going to hell. We're going to heaven. He's not going to devour us by getting us to go to hell. I'll tell you how he devours us. He devours us by making us Weak, making us weak. He can't get us to join him in the fires of hell, so he makes us anemic, he makes us impotent, he makes us ineffective, he gets us all weighed down with all of the pleasures of this world, 
many of which are nothing more than piddly diddly dumb stuff that doesn't amount to a hill of beans. And we get so involved in all of these things that we don't have time now for God. He makes us weak. He gets us to swim around thinking that all of these things that are earthly sponsored are ever so important when really they have no eternal value whatsoever. And if we live our lives as believers only involved in the things of this world, the truth is all we are is existing. We're not living a life for Christ. It's just existing and we're doing absolutely no damage to Satan. He devours us by getting us to be weak. You see, Satan is hungry. And you and I who are believers are on his menu. And he is on the prowl. And he's seeking whom he may devour. And it's a picture of a lion who is walking around. And he is studying his prey. So that he can somehow get us to look at other things of no importance and put our life and our time into those things when really the main thing is living for Christ and we forget about all of that because oh, we don't have time. Our allegiance should be to God, not to Satan. But so many of us have found ourselves being so involved and aligned ourselves up here with Satan, and he has just laughed himself to death because he has devoured us. He has got us. All of these things of the world are of no value. I don't mean to bring the chiefs up. But this afternoon, they're going to play. And if you're a Chiefs fan, there is nothing that's going to stop you from going and watching that game. We are pushing for the 4-0. and And we'll sit there and we'll watch that with our Diet Pepsis and our popcorn and our sandwiches or whatever. We would not miss it for anything. And yet when it comes to doing something for God, well, you know, if I have time, I'll do it. Well, you know, if a company doesn't drop over, well, it's a, you know, it's a convenience thing. I'll serve God if I can, if I have time. If there's a leftover, then I'll give it to God. What? That's exactly what Satan wants us to do. He wants us to be weak and not strong for the Lord. That brings us to a couple of conclusions here about this point. Number one, you've got to understand that Satan is actively studying you and me. Oh, does he study us. We all have areas in our life that are weak. We all have areas in our life that are strong. But Satan wants to know what those weak areas are. Those weak areas could be our anger, our lust, pornography, bad habits, insecurity, lying, trying to project some kind of an image to others when in reality we're not that. I mean, those are the things that we might be weak in. And whatever the weakness is that we know we have, Satan knows that weak area also. He is walking around seeking, studying us so that he can devour us. He can get into that weak area and literally gulp us down. The second conclusion here about this point is that Satan operates within parameters. In parameters. You see, he can only act by permission from God. He can only act when it is in line with God's purposes. 
Now, in one way, that should be very, very comforting to us. Because what we have now is an enemy who is studying us and who is attacking us. But yet we also know that Satan can only go so and so far. That's it. Now, here's the thing. If Satan can go so and so far, that means that when you and I enter into a temptation, that when you and I enter into a trial, that when you and I go into the fire, as it were, here's what it means. God has his eye upon us when we go into that fire, but he also has his finger on the thermostat. He is not going to let it be more than what we can handle. Because Satan can only work in the parameters that God gives to him. Number one is his identity. Number two is his strategy. Number three is his territory. His territory. Now, look at verse number nine, if you would. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Now, do you see the word brethren? Those are our brothers and our sisters. And then it says our brethren in the world. Everywhere on earth where there are believers there is a Satan who is attacking those believers, trying to devour them. Three times within the scriptures, Jesus said and referred to Satan as the ruler of this world. He allows Satan to have certain liberties and certain freedoms. The world is the platform for his attacks. The world is where he roams. The world is where he searches. And the world is where he looks for his prey. By the way, Satan is not in hell right now. In fact, Satan has never ever been to hell. One day he will go to hell and he knows that, and he doesn't want to go. But when he gets there, he's not going to be in charge. The truth is, when Satan gets into hell, he's going to be in chains. However, until that day when Satan is thrown into hell, he has freedom to wander around the world and seek you and me trying to devour us. And this is what we're dealing with, an invisible army of the devil and his angels. And yet we're living in a visible world. That makes it pretty tough. When you fight an invisible enemy, the devil has four principal targets, four of them. And you and I are not the first one on his agenda. The first target that Satan has, the first, is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ became the Savior of the world. Back in Genesis chapter number 3, God said about Jesus, He said, there's coming someone who's going to curse your head, crush your head, Satan. And that's going to be my promised Messiah, the seed of the woman. Ever since that promise was given by God back in Genesis chapter 3, Satan has been looking for a way to get rid of Jesus. And you know in the Old Testament, he tried to get into the line of Christ and destroy it. When Jesus was born, all kinds of things happened to prevent the birth of Christ. Ever since the birth of Christ, even to this very moment and today, he is still attempting to somehow destroy the work of Jesus. Because Jesus, you see, is the one 
who brings to us salvation. He doesn't want anybody to get saved. If you remember, he wants everybody to go to hell with him. His first target is Jesus. His second target are the holy angels. There is a one-on-one -on -one war battle going on between the fallen angels and the holy angels. And they are fighting one with another evil angels against holy angels. And Satan is after those holy angels. Here's the third target. The nation of Israel. The nation of Israel. You say, why is Satan after the nation of Israel? Well, you see it throughout all of Scripture. Satan is always trying to destroy Israel and the Israelites. And here's why. It's because Israel is the recipient of the promise that God has made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David, and others. Those promises deal with them, deal with their descendants, deal with their land, deal with the plan of salvation. Israel is the object of God's plan, and therefore Satan is without ceasing attacking the nation of Israel, and you and I can see it going on even in this very moment. An ally of the United States is Israel. And our country does well when we do what we can to be an ally to Israel. Because Israel is God's country. From Israel is where God's plan originated. And I know there's a lot of dissension today about that, but I know that we who are Christians and study the good book know how important it is that we stand with Israel. Now, here's the third one, the fourth one that, that uh, Satan is after, and it's us, the believers. Finally, we get... Satan to attack us. Peter says in 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, your adversary, the devil. So why would he want to attack you and me? Why does he attack us? Well, it's because it's God's favor that he has shown upon us God's grace is upon us. God's love is upon us. And that's why Peter, Paul, John, and every follower of Christ from the very beginning is going to be the target for Satan. Now, how does he do this? How does he attack us? Well, we don't have time to go into all of that this morning. Just a couple of things here. He attacks us, first of all, with slanders. The name of the devil simply means slander. And if you were to read Revelation 12, you would find out that he is the accuser of the brethren. And even when he came to God back in Job chapter 1, he accused Job. He attacks us with accusations. Slander. As the accuser of the brethren, and you and I who are saved are brethren and sisters, as they say, Satan attacks us, and you probably have heard his attack. Maybe you got done praying and you're thinking, oh my goodness, did that prayer even hit the ceiling? Did it reach the ear of God? That's Satan. After something has happened in your life and you're wondering what's going on, you're thinking, oh my goodness, how in the world can I be a Christian? Look at what I've just done. How can I be saved? That's Satan. Whenever I get done speaking, and it'll happen today, I'll go home and I'll think, oh my goodness, did I ever mess that one up or what? Satan. He's accusing you. He wants to devour you. He wants to drag you 
to hell, but he can't do that. So he wants to go after your weak areas. And so he accuses us and slanders us. And a second way that he attacks the believer is with persecution. Persecution. Now, back in verse number nine again, the words are these, knowing that the same afflictions, the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. He persecutes the brethren. And there are those who will say, well, now that happened way back there in ancient times, Bible times. Back then, Christians were burned at the stake and they were beheaded and all of that. That, that isn't happening today. There are those who have made a study on this. And they say that within the last 100 years, from 1924 to 2024, there have been more Christians murdered in that 100-year span than all of the years, the 1900 years prior. You can combine all of them and they wouldn't match the amount of people who have died because of their stand for Christ these last 100 years. And I'm not here to say anything about fear. That's not my purpose this morning. But I'm telling you that this is how Satan attacks Christians. It might not be as severe as beheading. But when you take a stand for Jesus, wherever you are, at work, at a recreation area, in a restaurant, there will always be those with time that will make light and fun and persecute you to a great degree. We know that for a fact. His way of attack is persecution. Now, here's the fourth thing we find from those verses, and that's, we're just going to call it frailty. It's frailty. In other words, Satan here has got to be engaged, and he's got to be defeated. Now, we don't want to tackle him by ourselves, of course, but the thing is, we can. We can be victory over Satan, and we should never ignore him. It is not for the Christian to come into a church like this and close the door and just say, I'm not going to talk about Satan. It doesn't work that way. Some people think too much about Satan, and I grant that. That's true. But the thing is, we cannot ignore him either. We've got to engage him. And the way we engage him is right up here with our mind. It starts with the mind. The mind is where we think, and then whatever we think has an outworking within our life. In our text, there are three things that we need to engage in. Number one, we need to be sober. We need to be sober. Now, this is not talking about being intoxicated with alcohol, although the Bible does say, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. This is talking about being, having a mind that is sober and is clear thinking mentally and spiritually. We need to be sober-minded. We need to be self-controlled. We need to be disciplined. We need to think clearly. In other words, we don't want to allow ourselves to be intoxicated by all of the amusements of the world. Be sober-minded. Because that devil is seeking whom he may devour. Whatever we set our minds on, whatever we think about, whatever we let come into our minds through our eyes, we need to be careful here. Number two, the text talks about being vigilant. And being vigilant means that we need to be alert and we need to be watchful. And we need to be on the lookout. And we don't need to be asleep on the job like Peter, James, and John were when they were in the Garden of Gethsemane and they fell asleep. 
Always be on the lookout for the attacks of Satan to weaken us. Always watch out that we don't get in compromising situations wherein we would be more apt to yield to the temptation of Satan rather than to be strong and yield and, 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 and go away from those temptations. Be sober, be vigilant. And then the other thing that is found in those two verses, verse number nine, is to be resisting. Resisting. Even James tells us, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, I want you to notice, um, if you can put on the wall there, verse 9, thank you, Katie. Do you see how it talks about the faith? The faith. The word, the article, the, is very important here. We need to resist the devil by being steadfast in our faith. Now, when I say in our faith, I'm not talking about our faith, our faith. I'm talking about the faith that is found in the Word of God. Again, the Word of God is the truth. The Word of God has it embodied in its Scripture what God has to say, and he is our authority, and our faith needs to be from the word of God. If you remember when Jesus was tempted by Satan three times, he always defeated Satan by saying, it is written. He always quoted the scriptures. Now, there's the three that are found in the verses. I want to give you a fourth one here. And that is, it's not found in the verses, it's implied. And that is that we need to be together. Be together. Be sober, be vigilant, be resisting, and be together. You'll notice that Paul is not writing here, or Peter is not writing here to just an individual. He's writing to a group of people. Be together. In Africa, when the lions are out hunting... What they do is they find a herd of animals that they kind of feel they can get a dinner out of them. Now what they do is they wait until they can isolate somebody, one of those animals. And when they can isolate that animal from the herd, that's when they get them. And when you and I think that we are strong enough to do it on our own. We're going to live this Christian life on our own. We don't need a body of believers like the church. We don't need to have groups wherein we assemble together and have fellowship and talk about Christ. Listen, when we get that way, we're like that animal who kind of like, kind of just isolates himself. And before you know it, bang, the lion has got him. Now, I need to tell you that Satan is a second-rate lion. The number one lion is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And the lion of the tribe of Judah is our Savior, Jesus Christ. The book of Amos, let me just read it for you, says this, Amos 1, 2, and he said, the Lord will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. When Jesus was on the cross there in Zion, he uttered loudly as a roar these words, it is finished. It's over. The plan of salvation is now over. You can receive Christ and you can spend eternity with the Lord in heaven. All you have to do is repent of that sin, turn to Jesus, give him your life, say yes to him, and he can become your Lord and Savior and you can escape hell and live forever with Jesus Christ.
Thank mm-hmm. you.